start the recording. Good. And then I guess um, if I can present first, I, I guess most of you know us, but uh, we are the side level at Bioimage Informatics Facility, meaning um, we provide support and training on bioimage data analysis to all research researchers in Sweden. So if you have a problem on how to analyze your images or want some consultancy, then you can always contact us and then we uh, use uh, state-of-the-art um, image analysis algorithms and uh, yeah, from computer vision, machine learning, bioinformatics, and we can help you. And we, that means uh, that's in Uppsala, Christoph, Avnel, Fredrik Nyro and Jonas, and we are connected to Carolina's babies group here in Uppsala. And then there's also Giselle Miranda connected to Karen Smith's group in Solna, Stockholm. So if you want to come in person, <laughs> you're also welcome, but easiest way to reach us is via our email address. And then, I'm super happy that Jonas is presenting Steinbock. So that was a uh, main project during his PhD in uh, Zurich in the Bodenmiller lab before he joined us uh, now recently here in BIF. So we are super happy to hear also ourselves more about it and hope uh, you have a lot of questions about it. So here you go. All right. Thanks, Anna, for the for the introduction. And it's it's really nice how many how many people managed to join on a Friday morning. So good morning to everyone. Um, so on the agenda are a few things for for this webinar. So the webinar is scheduled to last for about an hour and aimed at um, mostly biologists with not so much uh, computational background that are interested in uh, multiplex tissue imaging. And on the agenda is, is first a little introduction um, to processing these type of images. And then most of the, of the webinar will actually be focused on a, a hands-on session. So we're all demonstrate live. I hope everything goes well, fingers crossed. Um, and then I'll spend a few words on uh, downstream analysis and some summary. So as Anna said, this meeting is recorded. Um, so if you don't, and we also will upload the, the recording to the web afterwards. Um, so if you be aware that if you ask a question, you'll be recorded, but there will be time after the webinar and during the Q and A um, for, for more open questions. And this workshop is partially based on a workshop that I gave together with Niels Ehling, also from the Bodenmiller Lab in January in Zurich. And I also want to acknowledge that. Um, yeah, before we get started, um, all the material is available um, online. So if you cannot uh, scan the QR code or if it's impractical, um, there's also the link down here um, to the GitHub repository. Um, where you'll find all the material and where we'll also provide the link to the recording of this webinar. Um, I can maybe quickly show this. Um, if we go to that link that I just um, showed. Um, here, here's the, the web page for today's webinar. And there you'll also find the slides and especially also the, the instructions for following the hands-on sessions. Um, if you want to follow the hands-on sessions live on your local machine, um, you're welcome to do so. In order to do so, there are a few prerequisites, um, including uh, Docker. That's the main prerequisite. Um, Docker is a software uh, that enables uh, running Steinbock on, on your local machine. And uh, you'll also need some example data that we'll use during the workshop, which you can find here. So during the introduction, if you want to follow along during the, the practical part, um, I'll recommend to, to take care of these prerequisites. But as said, um, we'll provide the recordings online. So um, if you don't manage or um, you want to listen more on the introduction, um, you can also do that later. All right. Um, then let's start with the introduction. So I guess I don't have to say much about multiplex tissue imaging in this in this round. Um, 
But what we really mean here by multiplex tissue imaging or what we primarily focus here is on antibody-based uh, tissue imaging methods. Um, so this typically works by um, staining your tissue with antibodies or maybe also mRNA probes. Oh, and thanks, Christoph, for posting the link uh, in the Zoom chat. Um, yeah, so what I, what I mentioned, uh, this, this mainly works by, by staining the tissue. And afterwards, there are, there's a plethora by now of multiplex tissue imaging methods, which can be coarsely categorized into iterative fluorescence-based methods, where there are multiple rounds of iterative fluorescent uh, imaging, um, such as 4i or, or codex. Um, and mass tag based approaches um, that work with uh, metal isotopes as reporters. Um, and maybe important to mention here, Steinbock, the, the Steinbock toolkit that I'm going to present uh, was um, developed with imaging mass cytometry in mind um, because it was developed in the Bodenmiller lab. And um, that's also what I'm going to show today. But it is not restricted to that specific modality. Yeah, and what you get out of, of these multiplex tissue imaging methods are typically uh, per, per acquisition one multi-channel images where each channel corresponds to a marker that uh, is measured during the, the imaging. And this webinar will focus uh, on processing this type of, of images. Um, here you see an example of, of such a multiplexed uh, tissue imaging method, um, this figure I stole uh, from Hiki, um, and I think this is Ibex. Um, so yeah, you'll you'll see um, the, the complexity and also richness of, of information you'll get with these images. Um, Anna, could you maybe confirm whether everyone can hear me well? It what looks good, no complaints. Okay. I, as an audience member, can hear you. Good. Perfect, thank you. Perfect. All right, um, so processing this type of images, um, I mean, image processing is, is very general, but when, when I talk about processing here, what um, I mean is uh, generally some, some pre-processing steps followed by segmenting um, the, the objects of interest. So this would typically be cells in the tissue um, followed by quantifying this image. So followed by feature extraction. Um, and each of these three core steps um, uses certain uh, uh, certain sub-steps. So data pre-processing, for example, involves the extraction of image data that is usable for downstream processing from raw data that might be instrument specific and, and really prepare these images. So do some filtering um, and uh, noise reduction for, for downstream analysis. Uh, cell segmentation then aims, as said, to identify um, objects of interest in the image using, for example, what is commonly used, uh, supervised machine learning or deep learning. Um, and there are many paths to this. Um, very commonly, what is used is, is pre-trained neural networks. Um, but if, if uh, these don't perform well on your data set, you might also want to tailor them um, and retrain your own classifier. And finally, um, extracting single cell data. Uh, this really involves extracting, of course, the, the channel specific information, but also um, information about the morphology of the cells, for example, or which cells are, are neighboring in the tissue. And this is um, really what uh, we developed uh, Steinbock for. And Steinbock is a computational toolkit uh, for batch processing these uh, multiplex tissue images. Um, some, some technical notes, at its core, it's a Python package that has a command line interface. So what that really means is that after installation, you can operate uh, Steinbock on the command line. It's not the graphical user interface. Um, and to make everything reproducible and uh, platform independent, uh, Steinbock is, so this, this Python package, the Steinbock Python package is further wrapped in a Docker container that also includes third-party software. So Steinbock does not reinvent the wheel. Um, it's not a novel method in itself. It basically takes existing methods that are proven to work well on, on multiplex tissue images and links them together and makes them accessible to the user. 
Um, so you could think of it as a, as a bundle of, of existing software with a command line interface on top. Um, as said, it was originally developed for imaging mass cytometry and then links existing tools and approaches. Uh, important to mention here, Steinbock is not a pipeline per se, so it does not define uh, the sequence of specific steps that are, are um, that, that should be taken. There are other tools for that. But what it really does is it, it gives you tools to handle your data interactively. So in the, the individual steps are, are independent. Um, there is documentation, extensive documentation online. Um, you find all the links also in the, in the workshop material. Um, and currently Steinbock is not maintained by me. So I originally developed that the toolkit, um, but by the Bodenmiller lab, by specifically currently by Milad Adibi, um, and will also be maintained in the future. So here you see typical uh, workflows that um, you can do using Steinbock. So this figure is a bit complex. I'll, I'll walk you through it. Um, in principle, this shows a, uh, shows such a workflow. And below each step, so below each arrow, you see um, the command line uh, command that uh, runs the, the specific step. So we discussed before, there's some pre-processing step here. Then there's some segmentation step here, which you can do, for example, using this Steinbock segment deep cell command. And then there is some feature extraction slash uh, measurement step here um, to measure the, the individual levels of, of features. And what's shown here is not only the, the command for the command line, but also uh, the Python module. So if you did, if you're a Python developer, maybe, um, or have some prior experience with Python, you can also directly use uh, Steinbot from within your Python scripts, if that suits you. Um, what I didn't mention before is this export step at the end. Um, there is not really a consensus on how images are stored, how cell data is stored and so on in the community currently. Um, luckily, there are some initiatives about that. Um, so therefore, Steinbox supports uh, commonly various commonly used uh, formats for, uh, for export. So you really want to export the data to a format that can be read through uh, can be read using Python, R, or existing tools such as uh, Cytoscape, for example. Um, yeah, so this is a typical workflow. And with that, actually, we will start our hands-on session. I think we're well in time. Um, are there any questions uh, before we get started? I don't think so. If you have questions, you can also write in the chat and, and um, we're going to see them. Yeah, so let's start with the uh, hands-on part. Let me switch desktops. Um, right. So here I have on the on the left side I have the, the slides that basically instruct me what I what I need to do in order to showcase Steinbock to you. Um, but on the right uh, there's a command line interface. Let me just make this a bit bigger so you can see what I'm typing. Um, as said before, the prerequisites for following the hands-on session is that you have a supported operating system, which is pretty much uh, anything that's available, and uh, Docker installed. And instructions for installing Docker you'll find in the Steinbock online documentation, um, which, by the way, I haven't shown before, but it's maybe important to see. So you have some, some installation instructions, um, but the the key information once you have installed uh, Steinbock is here in command line usage, where you see for the individual steps, for example, for um, uh, segmentation, you'll see the options Steinbock gives you. Um, coming back to the, to the hands-on session. So these prerequisites um, are already fulfilled on my machine, luckily. And um, I also already downloaded the example data. Um, so I won't run these commands uh, here again. These specific are specific Linux or Mac commands, by the way. So these won't work on Windows. 
Um, but you can just go to these URLs that are, are listed here and download them manually. And the way Steinbock accepts uh, these or expects this uh, data to be stored on your disk is as follows. Um, so I have here a, a new data folder, um, which contains the raw data. So this is the, the zip files that you download, um, as well as a panel. And what we mean here by panel is, that, let me quickly open that. Um, this panel gives information about what's contained in the individual channels of, of each image. So um, you'll find more information about that in the, in the online documentation, but basically only these columns here are required or required are actually only these columns. Um, these are optional and all the rest here is actually coming from somewhere else. So um, this is not used by Stein. But what the columns contain is a unique uh, channel identifier and the label for the channel. So for example, here, the, the mass um, uh, uh, DI, so the, the isotope DI, uh, DY161 uh, contains the TCF7 uh, marker. And here it's also indicated that we want to keep um, those, uh, those channels in the extracted image. So this is uh, the, the panel file. And once this here is available, um, so the raw data plus the, the corresponding panel file, um, we can configure our um, we can configure the Steinbock toolkit for use. And in principle, one can run Steinbock by typing Docker run um, and then this URL. You'll find all the instructions online. Oh, sorry for that. Um, and importantly, uh, specifying a version. So Steinbock is a version Docker container, meaning that whenever you run the same command with the same uh, version, uh, it will produce the, the same output. So this is important for reproducibility. Um, there's a good question by, by Augustine in the Zoom chat. Uh, does the channel order have to match uh, the, the channel order in the images? Indeed, the channel, the, the list of channels is, is ordered according or sorted according to the channels in the images. So this is how, how the channels correspond. Yeah, so what I was saying, um, to, to run Steinbock, uh, you could in principle run just, uh, just execute this command um, and then you get usage instructions. However, um, you also need to tell um, Steinbock where to find the data, as which user you want to run, and so on. So the command becomes pretty long. So this would be the full command, um, where I specify here in, in that part where on the local um, computer I have the data. So if, if the data is somewhere else than in that specific folder, so that's the the working directory and within the working directory, the, the data folder, if it's somewhere else, um, then I would need to adapt this here. But in this case, um, my current working directory is actually wrong. So I quickly change to um, my working directory of this webinar. Um, so this is now my, my working directory and within um, this working directory, there is now a data folder. So here's the data folder and therefore I adapt that command or I can, can leave that command because um, that data points to here. So yeah, I was saying um, one can, can run Steinbock using this full command, um, but this is rather impractical um, because this uh, typing this every time is rather cumbersome. Um, so what we do instead um, is to uh, define an alias for this long command. Um, so using this alias command here, now if I type Steinbock, this um, is the same as if I would type this, this uh, long command here. And then I can just run Steinbock. Um, if you do this for the first time, this will also download uh, everything that's needed for running Steinbock, including the Steinbock Docker container. 
Yes. Um, as you can see here, Steinbock um, has a command line interface that is documented. So to run Steinbock, you can issue commands. So for example, um, Steinbock uh, segment, right? But you don't really know how the syntax for this looks like. And for this, we have the, the online, um, online documentation on the one hand. So here we would be in the segmentation uh, documentation um, where it says, for example, if you want to uh, segment using deep cell, you would type Steinbock segment deep cell and some parameters. On the other hand, you get a full documentation also built into Steinbox. So for example, if you want to know what the uh, subcommands of this segment command are, you can always just add a minus minus help. And what you then get is um, what, what options you have. So here it tells you, oh, there are two subcommands, cell profiler and deep cell. Um, so here you can then type Steinbock uh, segment deep cell and navigate basically to, uh, through your commands to see what options you have. Yeah. All right. Um, so this is usually the, the most complicated step. Uh, everything from here is just executing individual commands. Um, so I'll wait if there are any questions until now. No, I don't think there's anything. All right, then we continue. And what we can now with the, with the Steinbock command being defined, what we can do is um, we can uh, pre-process our IMC images. Um, here we apply some hot pixel filtering. So this basically um, removes individual hot pixels that um, used to be generated as technical artifacts uh, using the happier machine that was uh, used to generate uh, to, to acquire these images. Um, so if we now execute that and have a look at our data folder, you'll see that in addition to the panel and the raw uh, folder here, um, a new image folder is created. Um, and Steinbock always works in batch mode, so it always operates on multiple images. So if you look in the raw folder, there are multiple SIPs here. Um, and from these SIPs, it extracts um, these TIFF files. So you also get an output here, what Steinbock actually generates. Um, so I've shown you now the pre-process IMC command. Currently, Steinbock can only pre-process IMC images. Um, if you have another modality, knowing that IMC, so imaging mass cytometry, might not be the most common modality, um, this is currently not implemented. But um, as said before, Steinbock is modular, so as long as you have uh, one, uh, as long as you have these multi-channel images, um, these TIFF files here, what you can do is instead of starting from a panel plus the raw data, you can just start from an image folder. Um, so you provide the TIFF files instead and to, can continue on with the process. Um, there's also some, some metadata um, genera uh, generated here. So that gives you some, some extra information on what the images contain. So these images would be 600 by 600 um, pixels uh, with 40 channels. Yes. So now we have these images as, as TIFF files. Um, there are various way of, of looking at them. And that's something that we would always recommend is to really look at the images. Are they OK? Does it make sense also during analysis? Um, the results that you obtain, do they correspond to um, what the analysis, uh, do the, the images correspond or, or support your conclusions from the analysis? So always um, go back to the image data. There are various ways to do that. Um, various tools, ImageJ, QPath, uh, also tissue maps, I should mention here. Um, so there are various tools for that. What I personally prefer is uh, using Napari. Um, Napari is an image viewer that you can use from Python. So there's some, some coding involved typically. 
Um, but you'll find an example in the, in the workshop uh, GitHub page as well. So this is the napari.hypind. And I already pre wrote the script. So basically, we can now look at, at one of these images. Um, I hope it, it works now. It always takes some time. Yeah. So here we have the image now. It's currently not showing anything. So we can, for example, look at the, at the DNA channel here. Um, this is the, the generated TIFF file um, that we just um, extracted. And you see there are many channels. Um, so maybe I can, can adjust contrasts to look at it. Yeah. Um, but as I said, this, this looks OK. Um, the resolution is not great of, of this specific technology, but um, this is what we expect. So this looks OK, and it seems that the image extraction has worked. Um, closing this for now and continuing on the processing step. So now we did the pre-processing. We extracted uh, TIFF uh, images from uh, the, the raw data that was provided with some additional filtering of, of hot pixels. The next step would be to segment these images. Um, and this is probably where most of the time saved uh, is is achieved when when using Steinbock because this uh, if you use a pre-trained neural network such as uh, the Mesmer neural network by by Greenwald at all, um, if you use a pre-trained neural network, this is really just one command. Um, so I'm already executing that because this might take a bit longer, and in the meantime, we can can talk about it. So what I type here is. Um, Steinbock segment deep cell. So deep cell is the package uh, which ships uh, this Mesmer pre-trained neural network. Um, and this pre-trained neural network is already downloaded within the Steinbock.de container. Um, there's some additional argument that uh, we do a min-max scaling before um, segmenting these images. So um, yeah, what we do here is, if we go back to our data folder, we generate the masks folder um, in which um, so-called cell masks are, are saved. And these cell masks um, are, are basically, I wrote it down here, are basically grayscale images of the same size uh, and, and dimensions as the, the input image um, with a single, single channel only. Um, in which each pixel in the image uh, co that uh, corresponds to the same cell has the, is, shows the same pixel value. Um, so this is how, how um, these, these cell masks are, are defined. And uh, background is typically set to zero uh, in these masks. Um, again, we can, can look at the mask here. I rerun the Napari script from before. Um, my computer is a bit slower now because of Zoom. Um, but what the Napari script here now also loads are the, so I show the DNA channel from before, maybe with some adjusted contrast. But on top, I, it also loaded the cell mask now. So here I have the cells now colored, according, randomly colored. Um, and we can look at them and see how the segmentation looks like. Um, so. If we zoom in a bit, we see, although the signal is very noisy, the segmentation seems to have worked uh, quite well. There might be some over-segmentation maybe, but overall, um, I would say we're we are quite happy with the, with the result here. So this is the first image that I showed. Not all masks have been generated yet, as you can see, um, but we can quickly wait for that. In the meantime, maybe there are some questions. Otherwise, let's continue already. So after segmentation, oh yeah, there's a question. Just one. Yes. Is the automatic segmentation test in different tissues? Um, yes. So. This Mesmer pre-trained neural network that was uh, developed by Greenwald, um, they trained that on a large data set from different imaging modalities even. So imaging mass cytometry was only a very small part of that data set. 
um, but also across different tissue types. Um, that doesn't mean that it always perfor performs perfectly. Uh, if you if we go back to the to the slides from before, um, that's just one way that uh, Steinbock supports deep cell segmentation. If you observe that this does not very, work very well, so this would usually be the go-to um, place first. If you observe this does not very well, you might want to retrain that network, or you want to, um, for example, use Elastic and Cell Profiler. So Elastic is a random forest, is a, is a tool to train a random forest pixel classifier, which you can then use, for example, using Cell Profiler in order to segment um, your, your images in a, way that is really tailored to the specific data set at hand. Um, so I would say try first whether the, the existing methods work um, without tuning. And if they don't give good results, um, then maybe resort to more tailored approaches. And they're all documented online. And then there's a question, are there any efforts to make the pipeline work better on IMC data? For example, by training the model on larger set of IMC data. Um, so the pipeline worked better. Uh, the, I, I assume this, um, please correct me if I'm wrong, this relates to the segmentation. Um, what, what you need to understand here, this is pre-trained. So we, we are not training uh, the, the model on the current data set. Uh, we are applying the existing model. Um, so. Steinbock is, is not made to develop this, this type of models. It's only developed to apply them. Um, so in that sense, um, the efforts more go back to the community and, and to the creators of these models. And there is a very important initiative going on, the, the Bioimage Model Zoo, where people train their own models and share them. Um, I'm not the current developer of, of, of Steinbock, so I cannot say for sure, but I think in the long term, this um, might be a good thing to, to include in, in the toolkit to also use uh, other models from there. I hope that, that answers the question there. All right. Um, in the meantime, the, the masks were, were generated. Um, so we can continue with using the masks and applying them to the images, extract uh, features uh, from our cells. So one of the, the first features to extract is definitely the, the channel, so the, the, the pixel or the, the intense, intensity values per cell in channel. Um, and these are aggregated. So all the, the pixels, uh, I closed Napari now, but all the pixels um, that correspond to the same cell will be, um, in this case, averaged. So I can Steinbock measure intensities. And what this will do, if we go back to the data folder, here, here's the data folder. Um, so far, what we have generated is the mask folder, um, the image folder, um, and this will now um, generate an intensities folder. Um, this intensities folder for it contains for each image a CSV file. And if we open one of these CSV files, um, you can see that they're basically a large, um, large matrix where the columns contain the markers. So these are the names defined in the panel. Um, and the rows uh, contain the, the value in the cell mask uh, of the specific cell. So for example, here, um, object eight, so this would be cell eight. Um, this would be the cell that shows value eight in the in the cell mask of that image. Um, and this, and then here are the, the aggregated um, intensity values for the, for the varying channels per cell. Um, so that way you have already um, extracted your first uh, single cell data from uh, multiplex tissue images. There are other things that one can measure, as said before. So for example, morphology. Um, 
using the Steinberg measure region props command. And here, so far, I've only shown basically the, the defaults of every command. But by default, what this will compute is the area, the centroid, major minor axis, and the eccentricity of each cell. If I now only want to compute area and centroid, for example, ah, sorry for that, um, I can just specify that explicitly. So instead of using the default command, I can just write here area and centroid. And this will then measure, measure these two. And again, in addition to the intensities folder from before, this will generate the region props folder here, in which for each image, there is a CSV file containing the specified uh, properties. So here we have the area in pixels, um, as well as the centroid within the image. Um, I'll just rerun the command, so I, I stick to the exact same output as the slides are actually generated. Um, so this will just overwrite the existing files. So this is also important to know. And lastly, if we not only want to extract morphology, but also, and then the intensities, but also the get information about which cells are neighboring, um, one can construct what's called uh, spatial cell graphs or some sometimes also neighborhood graphs. And these are graphs, so networks, in which each node or vertex represents a cell in space. And cells that are in spatial proximity, they are connected by an edge. And if I now, there are many ways of constructing these graphs. So for example, KNN graphs. Um, but what we are measuring here is an expansion graph. So what that does is it grows each cell by a defined distance. So here we, um, we grow, for example, by four pixels. So that means that cells that are um, closer than, than eight pixels to each other, because two times four, um, they will be uh, they will be considered as neighboring. Um, so this will again, hopefully, yeah, so Zoom consumes a lot of resources, but this will um, construct um, these, these neighbors uh, folder, again, containing CSV files. And what they show, these CSV files, um, sorry, I'm in the wrong folder here, uh, neighbors folder. Um, what these CSV files show is basically just which um, basically pairs of, of two cells. So here cell two would be neighboring cell 81, for example. Um, for depending on, on the type of graph you construct, this will also show uh, distance information. Here um, it doesn't. Um, and this is another feature of, of Steinbock that is, uh, I think, quite important to construct the individual graphs and see how they compare. Um, so if you go back to the to the online um, documentation, measurement, and here neighbors, um, you see that there are different types of, of graphs. So for example, graphs that are constructed based on the distance between borders of cells versus graphs constructed uh, based on the centroids of, of the cells. Um, so, so various, various different examples here. All right. Um, and with that, we've extracted pretty much all information we, we can extract for individual cells uh, from these images. And then there's only one last step. We now want to actually process that data, uh, analyze that data, sorry. Um, and there are a few ways one can bring this. So as you can see, this data is primarily so far TIFF files and, and CSV files. Um, this might not be the best input for, for various tools downstream, um, especially because currently all these files are per image. There is not one file that contains all cells um, across all images, for example. And here, for example, to, to, to address this, we have this um, 
export commands. Um, you see there, there are many, many different um, targets to export. So for example, we want to export to FCS or um, to Undata. Um, but here the command I'm showing is Steinbock export um, CSV intensities or CSV, sorry. Um, this will basically uh, concatenate images and intensities or whatever data you, you specify. So if I run the full command, I want to concatenate intensities and region props. So these are basically just uh, the folder names. And I want to concatenate them across all images and save them to a file called cells.csv. Um, and this will generate um, the command finish first. Yeah, so this will generate one file, for example, the cells.csv um, that contains for, it contains all images. So here you start with all the cells from one image in a, a concatenated along the rows. Um, so if I go down here, you'll see there are different, uh, different images in the first column. Um, and the columns contain the information that I specified. So here, first the intensities. So this is the data from the intensities folder and then followed by the, sorry, there are too many channels here, um, followed by the region properties. So area, centroid and so on. Um, and this is then one CSV file that can be loaded, for example, in, in R or, or Python for, for downstream statistical analysis. Um, specifically, if you work in Python, I recommend to export as, instead of CSV, as undata, um, because undata can hold pretty much all the information, including the cell to cell neighborhood information. Um, so here we have an this command is slightly more complex, so we export as undata. And we specify that we want to take the intensities from the intensities folder. Um, we additionally want to include uh, the, the region props as extra data. Um, and we also want to include the neighbors from the neighbors folder. Write that all to the cells.h5ad. Um, again, this will generate one uh, one file. So it gives a warning here that basically just warns you that all the data will be loaded into memory, which is necessary for constructing this object. Um, but then it generates this um, undata object, which can be easily loaded in Python for, for downstream analysis. And finally, so this is, one of my one of my pet peeves um, to to enable uh, graph based analysis and network analysis on, on this type of images. It's also nice to export this this neighborhood information as um, attributed cell, as spatial cell graphs. So what attributed spatial cell graphs are um, is what I explained before: spatial cell graphs, and that they include the the for example intensities information. So these are the attributes of the cells. Um, and there are various file formats for that that can be processed using existing software. Um, one of them is GraphML. And here I'm showing um, how to export um, now all the neighborhood information, including the intensities so and the region props as um, attributed graphs. And if that's not entirely clear to you yet what that is, um, what this will generate is this graphs directory, where for, again, for each image, um, you, you get the GraphML file. And this GraphML file can be loaded in, for example, oh no, okay, that's, apologies for that. I thought I had installed Cytoscape, um, but I don't have it on my local machine. So this can be, can be loaded in tools like uh, Cytoscape or Gephi, where you can then visualize your network in space and run some, some classic uh, graph analysis, um, clustering coefficients and so on. Um, so this, this is really useful because then you can use existing, existing software for, for graph analysis.
Um, I'll also link the software in, in, the, in the GitHub repository. Apologies for not, not being prepared enough here. Um, all right, with that, we are at the end of the hands-on session. Um, you'll find all the instructions of the hands-on session in the on the on the um, here on the on the GitHub repository for the webinar. Um, here is the hands-on session, and also a link to the image vis visualization script. Um, and unless there are immediate questions, I'll. I'll have some some closing closing words on 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 this. Ah, but first, it's maybe good to mention what to actually do with the with that data that we just extracted. Um, so we won't have time to go into full detail here. Oh, there's a question actually. Uh, to generate the neighbors, which is the difference between expansion and centroid types? Um, so this is sort of two levels. Uh, one of them is how the graphs are constructed. So for example, by expanding the, the cells and then see how the cells are touching, um, or um, by, for example, just measuring uh, the distance between borders and thresholding on them, or by constructing the K nearest neighbor graph. So there are, there are different ways of, of constructing the graph. And the other one relates to what data is used to locate the cell um, within the image. So um, for example, one could use the centroids of a cell, so the, the center, um, and then construct um, construct graphs based on the, uh, thresholding the distance between these centroids. Um, but then there are, for example, also graphs that are constructed by measuring the distance between the borders of cells. Um, which usually makes a bit more sense, especially if cells are not perfectly circular. Um, so these are sort of two um, different levels we're talking about here. Um, if you want to know more and, and understand a bit deeper, I, I would advise you to go to the Steinbock documentation where it's all listed what they exactly do. And if that still doesn't answer your question, please, please reach out. Um, did you try to open the undata output directly in tissue maps? No, I haven't tried it yet. Maybe a good thing to try. Um, don't know whether let me see whether I have tissue maps here, then we can immediately try that. Um, no, sorry. Let's let's do that later. Um, so downstream analysis. A few words on that. I can't give a full intro here, but um, say a few words. Uh, one of them is. What I think is key to analysis, always, as said, go back to the images. So I put this here bold and red and everything. Um, always check whether it makes sense uh, what you what the results of your analysis um, indicate. Always go back to the images and look at the examples. And as mentioned, there are popular tools for that um, that are good with working on multi-channel images. I listed a few of them here. Um, but many work, and usually as long you, as you stay with TIFF files, um, that should be no problem to load these images. Um, then after extracting single cell data, um, there are, are a lot of different tasks that uh, comprise single cell analysis. Um, so this is the, the actual statistical science here um, that, that one needs to do. Um, this includes tasks such as batch effect correction using existing packages or uh, phenotyping the cells, so defining cell types, whatever that may be, um, using various approaches. So the, you can manually gate, which on multi-channel images can become cumbersome quite quickly, um, but you can also do some, some unsupervised clustering or mapping to, to reference cells um, or some some classification and learning based approaches. So plenty of tasks um, to, to do on the pure single cell analysis. Um, but what classic single cell analysis does not um, really take into consideration is the spatial distribution. And I think this is often forgotten. Um, often people just extract um, single cell information from uh, multiplexed images um, and then treat it as if it was non-spatial. And I think that's 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 sad, and 
this is why I would really recommend you to also look into various ways of how to how to uh, run spatial analysis, um, such as permuting the cells and see whether that changes distributions or um, run some community detection, aggregate neighborhoods, um, or some more sophisticated methods such as geometric deep learning on so deep learning on graphs. Um, so there are there are plenty of methods around, and this is I think a field that will still develop quite a bit. Um, but as you see here, my slides are very short on that. Um, if you are interested in that, I would really recommend you to um, check out this this amazing online page that a colleague of mine did. So this is the um, uh, analysis workflow for IMC data, where specifically everything that relates to single cell and spatial analysis is not specific to IMC. So if you go to um, performing spatial analysis, you see various way here of, of doing, uh, doing what I just listed on the slides in R. Um, and this also explains how to, for example, read the data that is generated by Steinbock into R. So this this is closely closely linked, um, and you can you can see all these uh, these um, fancy fancy methods of analyzing your, your spatial data. Um, so really uh, a good resource, I think, and and yeah, I really want to acknowledge Niels here for for creating that resource. Um, so this resource is part of a publication that's coming out soon in uh, Nature Protocols, um, where we describe the whole workflow in, in more detail and including the downstream analysis. So I'll invite you to, to check out the publication. Um, I'll share it once it's uh, published. That shouldn't take too long anymore. It's, it's accepted in its final stage. Um, so I'll share this. I have the email list of attendees, and um, I'll also add the link to the GitHub repository once it's out. If you, in the meantime, want to check out uh, uh, an earlier version of that, which is quite different, I have to say, though, um, you can also um, have a look at the preprint. And in general, when you only look at the single cell analysis side um, of, of things, so not the spatial part, but the single cell analysis part, um, there is a really nice resource on um, how to analyze uh, single cell data using a bioconductor. So this is our bioconductor environment where there are a lot of different, um, so this, this covers pretty much everything from clustering to, um, to, uh, to um, yeah. batch correction and, and other other topics. So normalization, etc. cetera. Um, this is often done with uh, single cell RNA seq in mind, um, but equally applies to to not mixed imaging. So this is this is an amazing resource, I think. Um, and with that, I'll finish that presentation. I think we're well in time. Um, in summary, I presented Steinbock, which is a toolkit for batch processing multiplexed imaging data, basically going from raw data to single cell data that is uh, useful for downstream analysis. Um, as I said, stay tuned for the uh, publication and the recording of the webinar. And if you have any questions, feel free to reach out by email. Um, also, I activated on the webinar page, I activated the discussions page. So you're also welcome to, to post uh, questions there um, because then also other people can, can see the questions and, and they don't need to answer the same question twice. Um, and yeah, but you're also welcome to, to reach out by email. And if you have any toolkit related questions or find any bugs, um, please reach out uh, directly on the, on the Steinbock uh, GitHub repository. Um, and in general, um, if you need support with analyzing your images, whether it's multiplexed imaging or not, please feel free to drop us an email here in, in Sweden. Um, some final remarks, uh, which uh, I have time for, I think. Um, there's, there are some things that are not documented online um, because they're a bit more advanced usage of the tool. 
Um, one of them is that Steinbock, um, if you look at the repository and um, maybe, maybe go back. So uh, Steinbock here, we use just Steinbock and specifying the version for our alias. Um, if you go, however, to the to the Steinbock website and look at what is actually available, uh, what packages are available, they are not only the ones with just the bare bones version. Um, so here would be the the one that we used, um, but there are plenty of different flavors of Steinbock. Um, importantly, this includes a GPU enabled flavor. So this, then you would, instead of specifying just the version, you would specify the version and then minus GPU. Um, and this can really help with large data sets, with segment processing and especially segmenting large data sets. Um, so this is, is one important thing to remember. There are other flavors. So for example, there's a cell post flavor um, that already includes cell posts, but currently not with uh, GPU support and not with a graphical user interface, but that's coming. Um, Many commands, that's another note that, that I, I would would make here. Many commands support memory mapping. And that what that means is that the images don't need to be loaded fully into memory. This is, again, important if you have large images, but that only the parts of the image that are currently needed for processing are loaded um, automatically by Steinbock. And to enable this behavior, many commands um, support this uh, minus minus m map uh, parameter. There's a question to that. Does export to undata support memory mapping? Unfortunately, not. And not because um, the the um, the data could not be read using memory mapping. But unfortunately, to concatenate the data, um, it needs to be in, in memory currently. So this is why you get the current warning. Um, there is um, also some, there are some efforts going on that I know um, on supporting running Steinbock on clusters that do not support Docker. So you have two options there. Either you directly install the Python package, um, which works well in most cases, but alternatively, you could also uh, run Steinbock using Singularity, which is basically a different software similar to Docker that is usually supported on clusters. Um, and one more note, if you have an Apple, a current Apple M1 or M2, unfortunately, the Steinbock Docker container won't run uh, due to some missing uh, or some incompatibilities of, of third-party software that is shipped with Steinbock. So yeah, sorry about that. And with that, um, I think we can go to the question and answer session and stop the recording.